La emisión está comenzando. Todos los asistentes están en modo de solo escucha. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Diego, could you please record the webinar because I don't have space on my computer, it's telling me. Yes, great. it is, it's, it's recording now. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, with that, uh, my name is Christina Suppold. I manage uh, the UNDP 6 National Report Project. I just wanted to welcome everyone to our first technical support webinar for the NASA Force Integrity Project. Really excited to have you with us today. Um, just, to, can everyone see my slides? Yep, I can. Yes, okay, Chris, I can confirm you are, you are projecting well. So in terms of background, in January 2018, we shared seven forest data layers for download and processing. Those were time since disturbance, tree cover in the year 2000, tree cover in the year 2010, the human footprint, tree height, country boundaries, and the WWF ecoregions. Our purpose today is to discuss your ability to access and use these data for the intended conservation planning and mostly reporting purposes at this time. Um, the science team would really like to learn about the adequacy of these data sets for planning and reporting relative to the IG Biodiversity Targets and the SDGs. We recognize that you likely are just starting to use them, but we definitely want to make sure that what we're providing you is relevant and usable. And then last, we're here to answer your technical questions and provide data processing support. In terms of the agenda, I'm giving you the welcome right now. Uh, then I'll turn it over very quickly to Andy Hansen from Montana State University to talk about the project and data overview. Uh, we'll take general questions and comments from the folks on the line from the pilot countries. Then Matt Hansen's going to give you an overview of the forest canopy cover, time since disturbance, and forest height data. Oscar uh, from the University of Northern British Columbia will talk about the human footprint data set. Andy Hansen will talk about the forest structure, condition, and forest integrity data sets. And then Patrick and Scott will go into the forest fragmentation and connectivity analyses. Uh, once, that done, I'll, once that is done, I'll facilitate a question and answer session between the pilot countries that are in the line and the data team. I also just wanted to let you know that throughout this whole presentation, we certainly do encourage question and answer. And if it makes more sense to do the question and answer after each of the mini presentations, then we'll definitely switch to that mode. I also wanted to introduce Marion Marigo and Martin Cadena. You have been working with most of them, but Martin is a native Spanish speaker from Mexico, and he's here to support our Spanish speaking countries. The presentations today are in English. We will share the translated Spanish and French versions after this call, maybe by the end of next week. But Martin is here. If you have questions that you're more comfortable speaking or typing in Spanish, uh, GoToWebinar has a function where you can type in questions. Uh, you can also raise your hand and we can ask you a question. And if you'd rather speak in Spanish, he can translate into English and then translate the English response back into Spanish for you. Um, if you need his Skype, please just type that in and he can also go offline with you and help with the presentation via Skype. Uh, Marion is also available for our French speakers and she's a native French speaker from France. So then next slide is I just wanted to give everyone a quick reminder that UNDP here is here to support the six national reports. We're providing technical consultation, administrative and data support. The pilot countries that are working on this NASA project for more in-depth data support, testing of data tools, and integration of spatial data into national reporting are Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, DR Congo, Ecuador, Guatemala, Indonesia, Peru, and Vietnam. If you need some additional support to you know, work with your ministry, to if you need a letter of recommend or a letter of um, acknowledgement about this project, whatever it is that you need, please do continue to follow up with me so that we're crossing all the political channels that need to be crossed to make this project happen. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that forests are integral to many of the Aichi Biodiversity Targets in the six national reports. Um, there are so many Aichi Biodiversity Targets, vulnerable ecosystems, climate resilience, sustainable production and consumption, ecosystem services, protected areas, they're all tied into forests. So that's one of the reasons that we're really excited about the project and the hope that it can help us uh, do more to address whether we're achieving the IG Biodiversity Targets. Um, six national reports, again, 
uh, because of the Zaichi biodiversity targets, there are many indicators, for example, with habitat loss that are tied into forest um, measures. What measures are you taking to reduce loss? Where is loss happening? Why is it happening? What are the rates of loss? What are the pressures that are le leading to the conversion of habitats? And what are the barriers to addressing the loss? And um, how can you make change? So we're hoping that you can use the data that we're providing through this lecture and the data that are yet to come to answer these really important questions and to be able to track progress on global indicators to achieve targets like um, IG Biodiversity Target 5. Um, and in closing, there are lots of relationships between IG Biodiversity Targets and the Sustainable Development Goals, and forests are key to achieving those goals as well. And I also just wanted to call out the partners that are supporting this project. We also have a UN Environment, and I need to add their logo to the slide. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andy Hansen to talk about um, the project and data overview. And there's going to be a bit of slide sharing while that happens. So um, thanks, Chrissy. Did we want to ask the participants to maybe just introduce themselves? So yeah, absolutely. I would love to hear who's on the line. Um, Adriana, could you please introduce yourself? Oh, she went back on mute. Okay. Let's go with, okay. Adriana, hi, are you there? Hi, you're on mute. Everyone. This is Diego. I just opened the microphone for our participants. So I just wanted to ask everybody if if you are not going to talk, please mute yourself. Just doing just right right click on your name and then mute yourself. Great, thank you. So it would be great to have a brief introduction from everyone on the line from the pilot countries. Ana Lucia, are you there? Hi, yes. Hi. Ana Lucia Orozco. I'm bio a biodiversity specialist from UNDP office in Costa Rica. Hi, everyone. Great, welcome. We also have Adriana. She's raising her hand. Hi, welcome. Okay, you guys are all unmuted. So um, if you could just take turns introducing yourself, might be easier than me calling out names. Um, is there anyone else who would like to introduce themselves? We have Naive. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, uh, so my name is uh, Susana. Uh, I'm a um, researcher at the Humboldt Institute uh, from Colombia. Um, good morning, everybody. Great. Thank you for joining us today. We have Patricia. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Patricia Huerta. I work in UNDP from Peru. I work in the Amazonia Resiliente Project. Great, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay, and I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this name correctly. We have uh, Nadje. Would you like to introduce Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, um, <laughs> I'm Nadesh from UNDP Vietnam. Great, thank you for joining us. I think it's pretty late for you right now. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the, this discussion. Great, thanks for coming. Um, we also have, is it Maiba? Yes. Hi, everyone. Hello, I'm Melibea Gallo. I'm a biologist working supporting the sixth national report from Costa Rica. Great, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We have Adriana, and she's not able to use her microphone right now. And then we also have uh, Tao Dong. Would you like to introduce yourself?
Okay, uh, well, I know that Dao Tung is also from Vietnam. Okay, so with that, um, thank you guys all for joining us today, and we will begin. So, Andy, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining in. Um, we're really looking forward to, uh, to hearing uh, your thoughts and questions and comments concerning the project and the data sets. I'll just give a, uh, a very brief uh, reminder uh, as to what the project's about. And uh, I guess I'll just say next, if that's okay, to advance the slides. So if we go to the next one, or if I can do it myself. Yeah, if you just say next, Marion can advance the slides. Okay, let's go to the next one. Yeah, sorry, yeah, if there is a bit of delay. It's just the it takes time for for it to appear on your screen, but don't worry, I hear you. Thank you. Okay, good. So um, the goal really is, as Christy said, to bring consistent satellite-based data and uh, analysis methods uh, to help inform the reporting concerning the Convention on Biodiversity targets. And then, of course, also the sustainable development targets, uh, particularly regarding forests and fragmentation and connectivity. Uh, the first objective basically deals with mapping those forest and human pressure layers. And we'll spend most of the time today describing those layers in some detail. Uh, second objective would be to incorporate the results of the project into a decision support system. And then thirdly, to make that decision support system available via the UN MAPEX platform uh, to you all and, and to other countries uh, to, to be able to allow you to access and, uh, and analyze and summarize the data sets for the reporting. Uh, next slide, please. So of course, these are the, uh, the countries that, that Chrissy mentioned and um, the analysis areas in the bottom in the boxes where we're, we're doing wall-to-wall -wall, um, data development. And if we go one more slide. Yeah, here's really the heart of uh, perhaps what we'll be dealing with today. This is listing the key data sets. Um, that will be presented. So the first four, can it be cover, forest loss, can it be height? Those will be, those three will be what Matt Hansen tells us about. Uh, those of course are already published and fairly widely used. And then the human footprint, the fourth layer, Oscar will describe. And again, that's uh, two years now in publication and fairly widely used. Uh, the last two are basically projects that uh, data sets that we'll be developing from this project that are really built from those previous four. And, and I'll be uh, describing those some. If we go to the next slide, um, you've seen this, this diagram, of course, it, it more or less is describing how the pieces of the project fit together, you notice that we have this decision support tool uh, in this blue box in the middle of the slide. We're basically pulling in various types of satellite and other data into that um, and then developing the forest condition and human footprint layers, um, integrating them into these measures that the, these new layers, forest structural condition and forest integrity. And then um, the fragmentation and connectivity of that forest, of those forest integrity layers will be developed um, by Patrick Jansen and Scott Getz. And then we'll be within, <clears throat> within the decision support system having an approach to try to um, basically evaluate the trends, the change over time in those conditions. 
to uh, to help with interpretation as to um, whether they're stable, improving, deteriorating. Um, additionally, the the yellow boxes on the right deal with a biodiversity aspect that that Oscar and James Watson will be leading, and that that's basically um, taking data on occurrence of of many species and and threat status of those species and basically analyzing the extent to which the forest data layers and human footprint layers are informative about those trends in in uh, in species status both as a uh, as a response variable of interest for the for the six national reporting but also as a way of of basically trying to to quantify the, uh, the ecologic one of the ecological values possibly of this forest integrity data layer. And then of course uh, all of this would be in the context of a of a decision supports tool where users are able to access the data, analyze the data, download the data, and then uh, listed at the bottom are the, what we hope will be the applications and and the communication vehicles. Okay, and then there's just one more, and that's who the team is. <laughs> so if we, if we go to the next slide, uh, these are just some uh, some photographs of the folks you'll be hearing from today, um, including the the UN staff with Christina uh, with us and and hosting the talk, and then you probably all know Jamie Ir Irving very well. Um, so with that. Um, if there's any brief overview questions, we could deal with with those. Or otherwise, Chrissy, uh, turn it back to you. Great, thank you, Andy. So we thought there was a question um, about the layers, but it looks like it disappeared. So this is your opportunity. If you have general questions and comments, we'd love to hear from the pilot countries what those are. <laughs> Uh, and there's two ways that you can ask questions. You can either just unmute yourself because Diego gave you all those credentials and ask, or you can type your question into the box. And again, if you're more comfortable speaking in Spanish, it looks like we don't have French speakers, then um, feel free to write in Spanish and we have Martin on the line to support the translation. And I know all of you on the call from the countries and I know that you typically do have a lot of questions. So I really do encourage you to reach out and. Let us know, have you been able to access and download the data? I guess that's a good place to start. Um, again, just rem reminding you that the guiding questions for today are just, um, are you accessing them? Are you able to use them? Do you think they're going to be relevant? If they're not relevant, why? Um, really want to know about the adequacy of these data for planning and reporting. OK. So there's a question. Um, from Dao Tung, data are only updated until 2012 while forests are losing fast. Eight years would be a huge gap. Can we have more updated data? Probably a loaded question. Well, um, this is this is Andy. Um, you know, fortunately, Matt's data on uh, forest loss and gain are now up through 2016. Um, and so, and, and then human footprint will be updated to 2013. Um, so those are the data layers that, that are, that have the finer time slice and the more recent. And I can, I can chime in Andy, I guess. Yeah. The uh, the I'll show in my presentation some some hints at the more uh, timely tree cover uh, attributes for canopy and height uh, that will help certainly with with tree cover gain restoration type things. Also understanding yeah really because right now we just match map loss, but as we map loss, a lot of people want to know what happens after the loss. And is it just a forestry land use or is it a deforestation event? And uh, so we have some contextual information coming, but it's not, it's in development, but I'll, I'll, it does address some of that uh, question. Great, and that's Matt Hansen, right? 
right sorry right that's okay so for the science team if you just introduce yourself each time you talk it'll help everyone to get familiar with with your voices okay great any other questions before we move into matt's presentation on forest canopy cover time since disturbance and forest height data Okay, so if there's no questions now, Matt, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. And I just really encourage everyone that this is your time to pick the brains of these brilliant scientists and figure out how to work together and for the scientists you know, to ask the questions that you need to ask of the countries. Okay, so over to you, Matt. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Yes, uh, this is Matt Hansen. I'm talking about some of the basic tree cover and forest monitoring products contributing to this project. Um, and you are advancing the slides for me, or am I? Yes, I am. No, no, I am. All good. Just tell me whenever you want to go next. Sure. Next. Our work has to do with the, the Landsat archive, and we're incorporating Sentinel-2 data. Next, please. And we're in a golden age of uh, satellite, uh, let's say, data volumes over the history of the TM through current uh, Landsat 8 systems we are getting about a quarter of a million scenes per year globally since 2014 before that uh, starting in 2000 we have pretty good coverage of roughly about half of what we're collecting now but the point is that we have systematic data inputs to do mapping of forest resources and it's really just getting better which is fantastic next slide we process the entire uh, archive to produce cloud-free time series inputs for mapping land cover and land use and particularly forest uh, our work mainly with forests is, is, is part of the global forest watch initiative led by world resources institute so we can take these data and next slide please turn them into biophysical representations of tree cover and where trees are coming and going in landscapes and uh, we can apply a you know a, a general algorithm at the global scale that we hope has local relevance so it's you know it's globally consistent but locally meaningful um, and you can see in this slide the reds are places of, of loss dominated so that would be let's say a lot of uh, south america pinks are both loss and gain and blue is gain so when you see pinks you're seeing forestry land uses in general um, you also see smallholder landscapes can be uh, highlighted as as landscapes dominated by loss and gain but our idea, idea is to develop long time long term time series of these dynamics and use them obviously for land use planning for understanding habitat uh, uh, integrity land use uh, protected area um, integrity and the like next slide please and so we look at uh, in particular loss trends and uh, when we look at the the whole idea is to monitor change over time so what are the trends of disturbance in particular um, intact forests what are the trends and disturbance in between uh, biomes and eco regions and this becomes you know the basis for evaluating uh, pro projects and programs and for example the deforestation in Brazil um, in this picture if you look at the color bar going from yellow to red the arc of deforestation in Brazil is yellow dominated and, and the satellite record is really was was the evidence for the degree of the problem in deforestation up to approaching 30,000 square kilometers per year by 2004 and uh, the policy success is reflected in this yellow color because most of the losses is, is is in the beginning of this of this record that I'm showing you now and uh, it got as low as 4,000 square kilometers around 2008-2009 so again the satellite being a really useful um, kind of input to monitoring uh, and est establishing whether interventions or policies are having an effect next slide please and we find that when we you know this is uh, closer to full res zoom but when we put uh, when we look at the data sets at country level we see fragmentation we see land use drivers uh, we can assess protected area integrity and here we have in, in the middle of this picture protected area clear protected areas being cleared in Cote d'Ivoire um, and so putting context on just a simple variable like tree cover is required it's, it brings meaning to the data so we do like to integrate the data with uh, GIS layers of land use uh, land use plans 
Um, and then we also even separate maps of, let's say, commodities such as soybean and the like. And you all of a sudden really understand what's happening when you can kind of uh, bring some value to the to just the tree cover layers. Next slide, please. Just want to highlight that this isn't, you could call it an operational product. We just completed the 2017 product. It's not released yet. It's close to being released. Um, but we are processing 250,000 images globally, uh, getting the map done in the first quarter of the subsequent year and trying to deliver it in that time frame. So we've got another week or so to get the data out there if we want to meet our, meet our, our self-imposed deadline. Um, so this is a, a thing that, it, that is ongoing and hopefully will continue. Uh, next slide. Um, and the global disturbance patterns are really, you know, increasing uh, over time according to our, our layers. And, you know, there's a big set of complicated uh, regional causes for that. And we don't have time to go into that. But this, again, this idea of monitoring trends. Next slide. The next three slides are just pictures of uh, the 2017 update, and we can just go through the big fires in the U.S. Next slide. Ongoing uh, clearing of the Chaco, in, uh, in, uh, particularly in Paraguay, as an example. Next slide. And uh, an interesting uh, dynamic in the Congo DRC, where we see some rather large clearings that look sort of agro-industrial in scale, which is unusual. We haven't seen that. It's usually smallholder clearings, but there's some big clearings. But the idea is whenever you get a New Year's uh, set of data, you see new fronts of, of, of clearing, new, new uh, uh, um, let's say, logging roads and intact forest, um, new drivers, whether it's uh, agro-industrial compared to smallholder. So Again, this is uh, the, in the nature of the pro product and, and, again, an operational one to give us some information in a long-term time series with some spatial detail. Yeah, that's fine. Next slide, please. We also do, as Andy alluded, mentioned in the list, we do the physical attributes, the classifiers that you might use to identify forest. And in the IPCC guidelines, we talk about tree canopy and tree height. So we, we are trying to map these explicitly, these classifiers, and this is an example of crown cover. And go to the next slide, please. And this is an example of height, and these, these static data sets are available, I think, nominally for 2010, but we're, we, it's not part of this project, but um, we're trying, we are starting to do these systematically annually so that people understand uh, what's happening given a disturbance, what, what follows the disturbance, is, is there a, a regrowth, is it a forestry land use or is it deforestation and the like. So if we go to the next slide, I changed the color ramp, but this is an example from South America where we have 32 years of tree height data. And uh, this is nice because obviously, um, you know, it's a long time series, it's a biophysical variable that you can easily understand. And uh, if you go through the next slide, we can we can see clearly deforestation in the Amazon basin. This is a clearing in like 1992 or three in Mato Grosso. Next slide, um, a, a clearing in Chaco woodland. So the tr the tree cover is shorter, but there, there's a very clear signal, and is a deforestation signal probably related to soybean uh, cultivation. Next slide, please. Here is forestry land use in southern-ish center west Brazil. And uh, so this is really important for us to start labeling land uses that are associated with tree cover to really fully discriminate deforestation from uh, forestry land uses. And there's a very clean signal for that. Next slide, please. And then here's a, a long-term recovery, which is an, an interesting city. We don't have a lot of recovery in, in South America, but this is our primary signal for getting at gain. And then we can use biophysical thresholds to say that uh, to, to define recovery, tree canopy that reaches five meters and persists for a certain number of years, we could maybe label that as, as re, regrown. Um, this is an application that we're using with WRI to do restoration, to plan kind of restoration monitoring methods. So we can start getting at more net dynamics. Next slide, please. 
almost done. We, we're also working on, on a, putting context to tree cover. So this is an example of intact forest landscapes. These are tree cover of a certain uh, structural uh, set of parameters that have no evidence of human disturbance. So these are the undoubtedly the likely high conservation value forests that are the target of projects like Red Plus. They, they're going to be high biomass, high biodiversity. And we monitor those systematically. We have a new update for this year that uh, that is uh, almost ready for release. Next slide. Another example of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a forest type added to tree cover. This is primary forest uh, for the three big rainforest countries and looking at changes just within this high biomass, high kind of co-benefit type of forest. This is the real target of interest for a lot of uh, a lot of the you know climate change mitigation policies and biodiversity monitoring uh, projects. Next slide, please. A key thing is that we do work with uh, countries in, in reproducing our methods at the national scale run by national partners. So we work in 14 countries and each each uh, interaction is, is different in terms of the way we share the methods, but the basic idea is to cut out the same data, use the same algorithms and map uh, the themes that are that are relevant at the national scale. In this example from Colombia, where we've mapped something akin to the IPC6, IPCC six classes um, and are adding land use to the mapping uh, exercise to get at uh, a national scale emissions uh, uh, estimate. But the point is, again, taking the global data and global algorithm and applying it at the national scale run and calibrated by national experts. Next slide, please. So my last slide is uh, just an example of some of the countries, some of the products that uh, that are made that we've made. And this is this is ongoing. It's mainly supported by USAID and Silva Carbon. Uh, but it uh, yeah, just a. Uh, just a couple examples there. So, so in general, um, I'm t I wanted to relate to you this idea of you know tree cover as our basic thing. We can map height, we can map uh, canopy, we can map disturbance, we can track time since disturbance. We're working towards getting at regrowth and recovery as a as a as a complement to the disturbance so that we can get net. And, uh, and so these basic layers can give some idea about the integrity of the forest and serve some of the goals like, uh, like that the Christina alluded to with uh, habitat loss and that sort of thing. I think that's kind of intuitive. And that's all I have for now. Thank you. Great, thank you, Matt, for that very interesting presentation. Questions for Matt? As a reminder, all the attendees have the option to, I think, Susanna, you can just unmute yourself. I see that your hand's raised, so I'll lower your hand and please ask your question. Yeah, hi. Um, so there are a couple of things regarding uh, Matt's data. Um, so you mentioned the uh, first, the, the work that you are doing with um, official institutions at each country, and I saw Colombia listed there. Um, and I wonder, um, because the data we have been provided are the global data, so I don't know if the, the possibility exists to work with that locally um, validated or assessed data for the, for the tree cover. That's one. And then the other, the question about, somebody asked also the question about the dates. We have been working with um, cover data that the last was, I, I believe, 16. But the, the three height is uh, uh, 2010. So that little bit of inconsistency between two, th those two data is um, um, source of our uncertainty for the integrity assessment, right? Um, so 
you mentioned briefly that it was not the objective of this project, but in case you had the updated uh, height data, will that be available through this project? So it will the gap between cover and height will be um, less. Um, basically, those are the questions. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, the um, the height data will be available, I hope, pretty soon. Um, the South America is our prototype region, and we have, I would say, a version 0 0.1 that, uh, that will be available. I, I don't have a definitive timeline. It could be as, as early as April, but it could be maybe three, three months out. Um, we would have uh, some rules or some warnings on it because it is our one of our first versions. So we would again we'd call it like version 0 0.1. But I understand the you know the need for it. I, I don't want to make a, a, the perfect be the enemy of the good. So we will release these data. Uh, we don't have them globally yet, unfortunately. Um, so other countries outside of South America, it'll be a little delayed. But um, you know, and then we have to. I will say we have to provide rules or best user guidance because when you take time series of cover and time series of height they can be misinterpreted in ter if you try to if you try to uh, identify change um, so we're going to make them I think somewhat conservative in identifying change when we map change directly when we map loss directly we are much more sensitive and we do a better job of mapping loss compared to time sequences so I'm getting into some technical aspects but we need to we, we will provide some some user guidance on on best best uses for this in a time series uh, regarding um so i again i think that's positive the, the new data will be available i think in the next three months for for south america in particular um for the for columbia we work with edm edm has quite mature processing methods and they have a very um uh robust kind of existing system and they they don't take our method wholesale they borrow some ideas and for a couple of the corrections that we apply but they do their own work on the forest mapping and monitoring the map i showed in this presentation was done in collaboration with uh gustavo galindo's team and idiom and we are right now wrapping up uh let's say a, a study on the changes within that six plus ipcc like uh set of classes as far as um getting those data I, i'm ha happy to in, you know entertain that I, I, I or even have a separate call with you about about where we are in that study and what 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 the deliverables will be um but uh but that that's work that's ongoing and nearing completion i'll just leave it i'll just state that much thank you matt that's Susanna, it. Does answer the question or is additional clarification needed? Susanna? I think she's on mute. Well, so, sorry, I was I was typing. No, that 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 was the perfect answer. Thanks. Great, thank you. Okay, I can see that covered it. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Matt? Okay, Anna Lucia. Hi, Anna Lucia. What is your question? Anna Lucia, you're unmuted. Okay, and if you're speaking, Anna Lucia, we can't hear you. So it may be a connectivity issue, but you could speak fine earlier. Uh, we just can't hear you at all. So maybe you could type your question into the box. Are there other questions in the meantime that we could take while we wait to get connected with Anna Lucia? Other questions for Matt? Okay, she's having trouble with the mic. Anna Lucia, can you type in your question and I'll read it out? Okay, oh, perfect. Okay, so Matt, the question is, 
Um, for Costa Rica, what timeline could they analyze disturbances over? That's a good question. Um, I, uh, we have some uh, preliminary products for, I'd say, Mesoamerica going back to 85. They are pretty, they're pretty gappy. So I can't say definitively, but um, we're fortunate that the Brazilian Space Agency in South America was collecting a lot of data for 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 the uh, for the region, um, and we have some. We don't have that similar rich collection for Central America. We can look into it, but you know the aspiration would be: can you can we go back to uh, 1985 and get a baseline all the way through present for everywhere in the globe? And I think each each region will be a one-off and have different uh, data depths because when we go when we go before 2000, there is no systematic record. So I don't have a clear answer. My, my, my recollection is that uh, it is, there are some data gaps for Central America and Mexico in the, eight, in the 80s and 90s. And that means you wouldn't have an annual product. You could have something, maybe a three year or five year interval product. Then when you get to 2000, it would become annual. And there are some challenges with how to, how to correctly interpret those kinds of data if you're doing net, net dynamics. But yeah, that's, long-winded answer that's not a great answer. Anna Lucy, does that answer the question? Feel free to type it in. Okay. She also is asking for, is it detail, reliability, and causes of disturbance? Is that kind of information also available? Right. We have two ways to bring, to tell the story about, let's say, what forest was cleared and what what the land use drivers were. The first one is we do sample based uh, assessments. So they're not maps, but we throw a probability based sample and we interpret, uh, we target loss. We've done this for the Amazon. We've done this for Central Africa. We're doing it for Indonesia right now. We've done it for a number of countries. Whenever we do these, the Columbia example is exactly one of those. We, so it's a, prob it's, a, it's a sample based estimate that you use to attribute uh, with, with um, known accuracy and, 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 a, and a, you know, statistical validity, um, how much, for example, primary forest was converted to pasture, how much was converted to soybean, um, how much of the tree cover dynamic is forestry. So we do it with samples. The other, the other goal is to then make maps of these drivers, and that's a harder thing. It's more research and development. Um, you know, are we allowed, are, are we able to map consistently over time something like soybean or palm oil or uh, smallholder agriculture? With samples, we can get these things interpreted fairly efficiently, and so it's a really easy way to get an answer. But people want maps, and the next step is really to prove that we can take those land cover, land use dynamics and map them accurately. Great, thank you, Matt. And Lucy, does that answer the question? And while we're waiting to confirm that, are there any other questions from Matt before we move on to the next speaker? Um, this is this is Andy. Say, Matt, when we uh, when we had our webinar with uh, folks from Ecuador, they were particularly interested in um, with validation of the, these data layers uh, at at a level that's that's uh, meaningful within country. Could you, could you speak to that some? It's probably uh, it's probably in the minds of of a lot of the folks on the call. Great, Andy. Thanks. So when I talk about doing these samples, um, the samples serve two purposes. I would I believe the number one purpose of doing sample based, so collecting reference data and looking at these variables uh, in in a validating in a validation perspective. But the first result of that. That is the actual area estimate. So you do these samples to get area estimates of all these different uh, dynamics in, in the forest and land use generally. Um, the second thing is to do accuracy assessment of the maps. And invariably, well, not always, but often, when you compare the sample-based uh, data to the maps, you see a bias in the map. So the map might be conservative, typically conservative. It could be it could be an overestimate. A place like Brazil, our maps are right on because the change is so large, so so large in area, so large in scale that our maps and our sample-based estimates are the same. 
a place like um, Congo, we underestimate change. So you do get a sense of the, obviously, a, a, a very rigorous accuracy out of the sample effort, but the sample uh, reference data really tell you the right area, and so they become the reporting number. Um, so we, whenever we work with a country, we do two things. It's 50% of the efforts, probably the mapping, and 50% of the efforts is the sample reference data collection, and we compare the two, and we want the two to be the same, and uh, most of the times they're not moving forward we try to iterate the product so that they they do uh produce an unbiased map that's our ultimate goal is to have a, a map that is unbiased and reporting the areas in a similar uh you no know, number to the to the samples but that's how you do that you, you you really need to work on both these things hand in hand and we do that at national scales uh just by by rec, by by a, in regular course, um, Ecuador. We did have a, 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 a collaboration with USAID, but USAID pulled out of Ecuador a while, long time ago, and we've kind of lost uh, we lost contact with Ecuador. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. So it looks like we do not have any more questions for Matt. So just know that we'll have another QA period. But um, really appreciate the informative presentation, Matt. And I hope that you all will know there's all the countries who can use Matt's data. There's an open line of communication now, and we hope that you'll begin to update it and then that just starts the conversation about how to use that data for your national reporting and planning. Okay, great. So next up, we have the human footprint data set. Um, and Oscar from the University of Northern British Columbia is going to present that. Okay, well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm on. Can everybody hear some, or somebody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Well, um, thanks for attending, everyone. I'm going to try and keep my presentation as short as I can. I'm going to be talking our, <clears throat> about our work uh, mapping the human footprint, which is Andy's going to then explain how it's uh, uh, used to map forest integrity. I'm going to take a little bit of time to give some background on the human footprint because I think it's not quite as intuitive a data set as forest cover, or forest height. <clears throat> so the human footprint methodology was first developed by Eric Sanderson and others uh, with the Wildlife Conservation Society, who's a partner on this on this project. Um, their basic task was to find the last of the wild around the planet, the last of the wild places. And they quickly realized that the best way to map wilderness was to actually map the human footprint, to map places that were modified and remove those from the land base or the landscape or the map. And what was left over was the places which weren't modified, the places which were still of high intactness. So um, we've adopted the human footprint framework. The original map was produced for 1992, two years ago. The advance the slide, please. Two years ago, we start, we uh, published updates of the human footprint map, uh, recreating the 1993 layer. Uh, poorly intercomparable with our more recent map, which is a 2009 map. This slide is just showing the overall workflow, giving an idea of how the human footprint come together. The first step is basically to acquire um, consistent information on major forms of human pressure. So these can be things like our infrastructures, our human population density, the distribution of our agricultural lands, as well as um, ways that we access natural habitats, you know, be it by roads or navigable waterways. The second step is because each of these individual layers have different units, the second step is to bring them onto a consistent and comparable scale and then finally to overlay these now comparable pressures together to come up with a, a cumulative pressure map, which is the human footprint. Next slide, please. Um, don't worry too much about the detail here, obviously, but this is just showing how we score uh, each of the individual pressures. They're placed onto a zero to 10 scale, though not all of them reach a, uh, an intensity of 10, for instance, navigable waterways. It's, it doesn't have any direct modification of the habitat, but it allows access into otherwise unaccessed places. So 
uh, navigable waterways gets a maximum score of four. Um, next slide, please. Okay, this just shows uh, you know at the course global resolution, um, the 2009 human footprint map. You can see it varies in the end from a scale of uh, zero being fully intact the way we're mapping it to 50, you know, our densest cities, basically. And what you're seeing, you know, a lot of spatial variation around the planet and human footprints. Um, the most modified places being the Eastern US, Europe, India, parts of China. Um, and many of the world's intact places are found in uh, some of the partner countries on this project. Okay, next slide, please. Um, our products all undergo visual validation. So we have about 3,000 one kilometer sample plots where we have high resolution imagery, where we've kind of used a consistent way to score these plots. And we have a good idea of, of really what's there on the ground. Imagery is about uh, 0 0.3 meters on average, or 0 0.5 in places. Um, so we get to compare any of our data products or the different ways we combine the data. We always get to compare it against this validation data set. Um, next slide, please. This is just showing uh, the results of the validating the 2009 map. On top is the visual uh, validation score. So this is not from the human footprint data. This is based on our scoring. You can see that's the distribution of our plots and, and the pattern is very similar to the human footprint map. The um, lower panel, that's showing the agreement and disagreement between the human footprint and the validation. And in general, um, about 90% of the time, the human footprint is uh, very close within 20% of the, uh, the validation score. And, and we consider that to be a, a, a hit and accurate uh, map of, of cumulative human pressure. I'll just add that this is a um, global validation. We're not breaking it out. We have broken it out by biome, for instance, and find fairly consistent results at the biome level. But we could, for this project, if, if partners would like us to validate our new products um, that we're going to be making available to the partners, validate those at the country level. Um, the sample set will obviously be a lot smaller for that validation, but we could report on what's the accuracy of pressures mapped in, for instance, Colombia. OK, next slide, please. Um, so now I just want to show you some of the things that the human footprint can be used for, given that um, you know they're not necessarily the, the sort of data that we always work with, or uh, or that you're used to working with in your day-to-day -day, um, applications. So one thing that we've we're doing, and we're um, uh, uh, about to publish the paper or or submit the paper, is projecting future change in in wilderness. So we've seen a a uh, fairly substantial decline since 1993 in places that we can consider to be wilderness. Uh, we can identify the characteristics of those places which we've, which have lost, which have succumbed to expanding human footprint. Um, and then we can look across the remaining wilderness and ask, well, which of the remaining wilderness shares similar characteristics to places that have been recently lost? Um, and then we can use that information to project future change or the future probability of of change, so we could identify places of which are um, largely intact forest, which uh, are likely safe from near-term conversion, uh, and contrast that with places that are likely to come under increasing human pressure in the near term. Next slide, please. Um, we're also, and and other groups are also doing a lot to connect the human footprint to biological impacts. Um, so this is a paper that was published a couple of months ago in Nature using our 2009 human footprint map to look at mammal movements all around the planet. So they have collared uh, radio collars from uh, many species of mammals. And on the y-axis, the, the, they're showing the movement patterns of those mammals against the human footprint on the x-axis. And the, the y-axis is a log scale. So any change uh, in the y in the y axis, any any decline in movement is actually very big, uh, being a log scale. And what we're seeing here is almost a tenfold decrease in how much mammals move in higher human footprint places. So we're learning something about the ecology. Um, your uh, mammals are, are much less able to move in places of high human footprint. And that's very important ecologically from a 
uh, perspective of finding resources, finding mates, uh, adapting to climate change. So we're seeing your connection between uh, you know, uh, ecological impacts and human footprint uh, or human pressure. Next slide, please. This is some work that uh, we haven't yet published, looking at changes in the extinction risk of mammals uh, over the human footprint time horizon. Uh, so some species uh, are maintaining stable uh, extinction risks or even improving, and other species are, are um, uh, becoming more endangered through time. And we're trying to explain the, the trajectory through time for, different, for these different uh, groups of species, those which are at low risk versus high risk. And we're finding that human footprint, uh, when stacked against everything else that we're using, um, seems to be the strongest predictor of change in uh, species extinction risk over time. And these aren't just forest species. These are uh, all species that, that span all biomes. The, um, the only other stronger predictor is uh, the range size of the species. And so narrowly distributed species are more likely to become endangered, but that's not really a, a human pressure measure, obviously. Okay, next slide, please. So just to wrap up, um, for this project, we're updating the human footprint to cover the period uh, 2000 to 2013 is the most recent we're able to get. The data that we're using in a number of instances is quite a bit better than the 2009 map. So our census units for, for population density, so mapping where people are, are much more refined, um, as well as in most places our roads data is a lot better. We're, we're using um, open street maps, which is more resolved in most places than what we used before. So we've done the validation, uh, which we're just wrapping up of the 2010 map, because that best matches our validation period. We're finding um, much better outcomes than the 2009 layer. And then we're just now starting to work on connecting uh, the human footprint in this new time period to ecological impacts. So we're, we're working through different biological data sets, in particular, the Living Planet Index, which shows population trends for 3,000 uh, populations over time. So they're nicely spatially resolved and temporally resolved biological data. And uh, we're at the moment running those data against the human footprint, but uh, plan to also run it against some of the other products coming out from the, um, this project, which Andy's gonna talk about next. And I think that's, that's all that I really wanted to cover. Great, thank you so much, Oscar, for that presentation. So I think we have a holdover presentation from Anne Lucia from the previous one, but it, it might be for Oscar. I'm not sure if it's for Oscar or Matt, so I'll read it out and then we'll figure it out. Um, the question is, if, if Costa Rica provides detailed layers for the in-use change of pineapple, could you use this for the analyses? And again, she's having microphone problems, so she's not able to clarify. So if that question is not clear, hopefully she could, you guys could ask a clarifying question and then she could type it back in. I'll maybe ask um, it, if that question is looping back to the, um, the the drivers of forest loss that that Matt Hansen was talking about before. Um, sounds like it most likely is, but if we could clarify if it's a, if it's a human footprint or kind of a, a forest cover, and drivers um, question. Okay, and Alicia, can you clarify that if it's a forest loss drivers or forest human footprint? In the meantime, we'll go on to another question and then we'll come back to you. So we have a question from Muhammad who's asking, how many types of human pressures do you use for this research? So we, we map eight, eight pressures. So we have kind of eight data sets coming in um, some of them are, in, are infrastructure, so built environments, um, electric infrastructure, reflective of a few infrastructure types, um, kind of general pressures uh, like human population density, um, agricultural land uses like our crops and our pasture lands, and then access, so railways and their direct impacts, roads and their direct impacts in terms of building a road and its surface and immediate disturbance, but as well as access into the habitats adjacent to roads um, and navigable waterways, uh, just as a, as a kind of access pressure. So eight, eight forms of, of pressure. 
Great, thank you. Mohammed. I'm gonna take you off mute and you can confirm that that addressed your question. Mohammed, does, does that address the question? Yes, that's correct, thank you. Okay, anything for follow-up? Uh, not from me. Okay, and what country are you from? Uh, from Indonesia. Okay, great. I'm glad that you're able to join. It's funny. I just got an email from Malwan saying that no one would make it. So welcome. Thank you. Okay, so Anna Lucia is saying that her question on pineapple was from the previous presentation, so from Matt Hansen's presentation. Yeah, and Matt, and, the uh, uh, this is Andy. So Matt had to uh, had to leave us. Um, I'm not sure if any. Could, could you possibly repeat the question and we'll see if any of the team might be able to address it? Yeah, absolutely. And she's having microphone problems, but she's raising her hand. So let's try again and see if we can unmute her. Hi, and Lucia? Are you there? I think we're having the same issue. So the question is, if Costa Rica was to provide some detailed layers for land use change of pineapple, could you use this for the analyses? So let's, uh, Andy again, um, let's, um, we'll just forward that question to Matt and, uh, and see where it goes. I, I think there, I think his group has been working with folks in Costa Rica pretty closely. So hopefully that uh, the link has been made and, uh, and those data sets would be quite useful. Okay, great. So, and Alicia will make sure to connect you guys after the call. Uh, other questions? Okay, we have a question from Susanna. Um, yeah, hi. Um, so, hi. I, I will um, I will be interested because in the in Humboldt we have a team that is right now uh, trying to get a map of the human footprint with updated information from Colombia for the last years and and uh, improving the historical information. So you mentioned that you could uh, run the validation as, at, at the country level. Uh, I wonder if um, how can we uh, um, kind of connect to, to get those results and if there is the option to collaborate to get the locally validated human footprint for Colombia. And I raised this issue because um, I mentioned this before in Washington at some point that in order for Colombia to use uh, any kind of data set for a national reporting, they, there should be a process of validating locally for the, uh, from the local officials. And with the, with the core information, I think is, is covered because the AM is involved, but with other information like integrity, even if it's um, uh, derivated from validated data or human footprint, um, I think we should consider the path to officially validating the data if we want to include it in reporting. So I just I just give them the, the option of how to collaborate to get that uh, validation done. Um, yeah, so I guess there, there are two ways to validate the human footprint as well as uh, the other derivative layers um, or integrated layers. Uh, the one is directly through our validation uh, approach, at least for the human footprint. I, I don't know if we can use that for the other layers, but a Andy's thinking about how to um, how to validate the integrity map. But in terms of the human footprint, we can, we can definitely map uh, or sorry, do the validation just for Colombia, so so clip out the rest, focus on Colombia, and do the validation. My guess is we we probably don't have enough of our three thousand plots within Colombia to do a, a a good validation. So the best way forward in that respect might be to put some energy into developing a validation data set for Colombia in particular. We could talk about options for for how to do that. Um, and then the other approach for validation is to look at biological responses. So, you know, ultimately what we care about, obviously, is, you know, the state of our natural systems. Are they improving? Are they deteriorating? And a big component of that is, is uh, our biodiversity and our ecological communities. 
So if there are data sets available on the condition of biodiversity, be it distributions or range contractions or population trends, one way to validate these data sets is to look, well, are they informative or explaining what we're observing in terms of biodiversity responses or uh, other ecological trends? So either one of those approaches would be interesting to, to explore in Colombia. Uh, in terms of the validation plots, though, I do think we'll need um, we'll we'll need a bigger uh, a bigger effort to develop plots for Colombia. We can talk about the best way forward. Uh, I'm very open to kind of expanding the work that we're doing uh, in the umbrella of this project. Uh, we do have a, a Colombian PhD student, which is going to be starting in the next couple of months, and the idea is to integrate him with these overall sorts of questions. Um, I didn't realize you guys are actually developing human footprint map for Colombia. That's fantastic. Um, I'm very open to kind of looking at options for uh, validating against plots or biological data and protect potentially through a, you know involvement of the um, the student. Great, thank, thank you. you. I, I I just want to clarify. Maybe I was confused, confusing. But uh, when I meant validation, I meant like official recognition of the layers, uh, more than um, statistical validation or technical validation. Is the recognition from official entities that the layers used for reporting are uh, approved in some way. So um, my point there is that uh, in a special, in particular for human footprint, um, if we team together with the efforts of Humboldt, it might be a, a pathway to uh, get the official recognition of the layer and then the use of that layer in official reporting. So great that you are open to, to collaborate. I will take you on that. Okay, sorry, I did mis misinterpret um, your question there, but that's fantastic if, if you think there are ways to, because I, you know, oh, at a higher level, that's the driving force behind this entire project is to have the data that are being produced used for national level decision making and reporting. Um, and if there's a process in Colombia to to better to better integrate what we're producing into um, into kind of national level data usage, different usages. Um, I think you know that that sounds well well aligned with the project, and uh, certainly on the human footprint side, I'd be happy to to work with you to uh, help that happen, help it get recognized uh, officially. So, Susanna, uh, Andy here. I wonder if you could just comment on, just in brief, what what is the process by which a data layer like human footprint would be would be sanctioned for use by the government so there are there are two institutions there there's one institution that is in charge of producing the official reporting and, and that's idea and that kind of it, they basically cover everything regarding um forest change and, and uh, impacts of that. And Humboldt has the biodiversity component of it. So we are uh, working on indicators that could be used in reporting, um, specifically seeing the impact on biodiversity. And given that we didn't have a national uh, human footprint layer yet, well, not uh, recent. So we started doing um, the updating of the layer with the with the methods that Oscar mentioned. Um, so the way to integrate layers like human footprint and forest integrity will be through their impact on biodiversity indicators. Um, we have the, the platforms to do that, but we just um, we are just a little delay regarding the layers that will feed, feed on that. Um, but we are working on that. So the, the pathway will be to validate or to produce a locally local validated layer that then could be used in the official reporting. 
and that's um, basically jurisdiction of Humboldt. So in that way, that, that pathway will be easier than if we, we will look for um, cooperation with other institutions. It, it might be harder to do that. I don't know if that answered your question. Well, just in, uh, in general, it seems like we have a real opportunity in Colombia to work together to, uh, to, to, to assess accuracy of these data sets as well as to work towards getting them approved for use, you know, in government reporting um, between, between all the humble work and the new project that Patrick and Scott have funded and this project and Oscar's work, uh, it just seems like we can do well to put our heads together on um, on making progress in those fronts. So thanks for the comments. Great. Yeah, so it sounds definitely. like some progress being made and it would be exciting to, to see that happen. Are there other countries that we can follow a similar similar process in to achieve the same results. I know the question of validation and you know the global versus the national level data sets is important to everyone, and I think it's a issue that's going to come to the forefront rather quickly as we begin to uptake these data sets and see how useful they are. And if we're not open for a discussion at this point, perhaps we can come back to that at the end of this call. Great, okay, so there's a lot of other questions coming in. Can we have the access to the methodology to do the human footprint? This is from Patricia. I'm gonna unmute her. Hi, Patricia. Are you there? Okay, I think she had microphone problems before, so I'll just uh, turn it over to you, Oscar, to answer that question. Um, yes, in addition to the data, um, there's a data paper which describes in detail all the methodology, so the, the eight major layers, how they're derived, um, how they're scored in terms of the uh, human footprint scale, and then how they're integrated all together, as well as the validation, you know, how how to score validation plots if you want to develop more for your particular country. So yes, um, I guess we haven't yet made it available to the, to the partner countries, but we'll, um, we'll make sure to follow up with that and, and put the data descriptor um, into, the, into the shared folder so everyone can, can see the, the exact methodology for, for uh, further replication. Great, thank you. If that doesn't fully answer your question, Patricia, please uh, just type it back in. So the next question is from Adriana, and she also has microphone problems. Is it possible to have an updated series in order to inform the achievements of the IG biodiversity targets in 2020? And then she's also wondering, what is the frequency of this study, um, the series of years that it encompasses? So in terms of the update, yes, that's um, really our major work task for this project. So we've we've updated with the time series to ma to as best we can match um, Matt Hansen's forest cover data set. So we have a map for 2000, one for 2005, 2010, and 2013. So we're just doing the final validation of those layers, um, and then they'll be made available, uh, clipped to to each of the partner countries, um, shortly. I'd say let's say within the next month or so. Great, thank you. And Joanna, if that doesn't really answer the question, just type in additional clarifying remarks. So the next question is from Vietnam and Najee. You mentioned the visual validation confirmed accuracy of the human footprint in 90% of cases. Can you explain why it didn't work in the other 10? Um, it's hard to say. It'll be different, different reasons in different places, but one of the major reasons we were missing um, in those 10% of cases was uh, often the, the resolution of the population density data. 
So we're mapping population density by census units. So we, you know, we can't remotely sense individual people. Instead, we, you know, these data are not collected um, by satellite, but rather by bottom-up uh, census initiatives ac across countries. So the census units, especially for the previous update, were fairly large. So the population density would be spread across a census unit, uh, where in fact um, people live, you know, within communities, within concentrations. Um, to, of different magnitudes. So often the human footprint would map uh, human presence in places slightly outside of where they were actually located. So in parts of a census unit, um, which didn't have a, a true settlement. Uh, so I think part of the reason why the validation of newer layers is coming out better is because we have smaller census units and better ideas of where people are located. Great, thank you. And I'm going to take uh, Najee off of mute. Does that answer your question? And do you have anything additional you'd want to ask? Najee, are you on the line? Thank you. OK. OK, so um, it looks like we have no more questions, which means I'm going to advance us. I think we changed up our format a little bit to be asking the questions after each presentation, and I think that makes a lot more sense. And then we have two more mini presentations left. The next is from Andy Hansen at Montana State University. He is going to be talking about the forest structural condition and forest integrity data sets. Over to you, Andy. Thank you, thank you. Um, right, so, so now we'll talk about how we're trying to integrate the data layers we've heard about so far into some new products that we we think have potential to be very relevant to biodiversity and thus to the uh, ACHI targets. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, this is just a, uh, uh, and, and then one more past this one. This is actually an error, so there we go. Yeah, so, so this is just a, uh, sort of a cartoon of the approach. First, in the upper left-hand side, that's representing um, basically serial stages of forest and depicting how they differ in terms of height and cover um, and time since disturbance. We'll be producing a layer of that structural condition. Um, that um, that's very relevant. We, you know, st structural condition is very relevant from a carbon modeling perspective. It's, it's very uh, important from a biodiversity perspective um, and from even uh, ecosystem services to people. We'll then be combining that forest structural condition layer with the human footprint that Oscar just described to get at what we've called forest integrity. And under this um, classification, places of high forest integrity are somewhat like in the photographs here, uh, where these are places that have tall trees and high levels of canopy cover and have not been disturbed for several several years, um, and also have low human footprint. So these might be the sorts of settings where species that require dense forests but are very sensitive to human presence would still find habitat, um, and perhaps those species would would be uh, not finding suitable habitat elsewhere. If we go to the the next slide, we'll we'll just try to put these layers in in context with the sort of work that's been done before in other words these two new layers just add to the uh, increasingly rich ways that we have to map forests across the world um, 
So on the left here, we have forest characteristic, and of course, forest extent is the first one. That's simply where are the forests. It was really in 1985 when AVH or our satellite data were, were initially used to do that mapping. And then initial efforts to overlay human pressure on forest presence were used to get at forest intactness. And then uh, the sort of forest loss gain approach that Matt Hansen described came in, and that allowed um, basically us to understand um, deforestation patterns. And then uh, forest uh, canopy height we has been mapped really only in the last um, few years. And then Matt Hansen as well mentioned his his intact landscape index um, that basically integrates several of the layers mentioned above, including things like pack size and distance from edge. So each of these layers has um, particular uses. They tend to overlap with each other in some, ex just in some ways, but be unique in other ways. And so our forest structural condition and our forest integrity are meant just to add to this fairly rich set of ways to map forests. Um, and for our project, really each of the individual data layers, along with their integration into structural condition and forest integrity, we think are potentially useful uh, re regarding assessing forest change and fragmentation and connectivity. Okay, so now let's let's talk a little bit more about the forest structural conditions. So if we go to the next slide. So you're all familiar with basically the successional stages of forests that are widely recognized for forests globally. Um, these four stages basically represent the time just after disturbance when stands are are, are reestablishing to the stem exclusion period where there's self thinning going on to uh, to a, a understory reinitiation where small gaps are forming by the canopy trees that die and that's allowing higher light levels on the forest floor and seedlings to, to be established in the second time. And then the, the, the primary forest stage or old growth stage um, that occurs thereafter. Well, we're trying to combine um, Matt's data layers, if we go to the next, to be informative relative to these successional stages, <coughs> as well as to the structural characteristics of those. So the, if we could have the next slide, please. So this is a, an example of our the ways we would we've combined um, on the left times since disturbance, so years since forest loss. And we have these three age age categories of less than eight, eight to fourteen, and and greater than fourteen, and we're suggesting that in in many humid tropical forests that those time periods are meaningful relative to successional development um, with uh, the less than eight being that that very recently disturbed the eight to 14 perhaps being representative of stem exclusion and early secondary and then the greater than 14 potentially either being sort of later secondary or actually primary um, and then on the right, we have um, three categories of forest height from short to tall. And then within those um, three levels of canopy cover. And uh, the numbers in the matrix basically represent weights, if you will, weights of this structural condition index. So a weight of 27 would be the forest that that are the, the tallest, oldest forests with highest canopy cover. Now, you'll notice that the, the intervals here are, 
um, are based on uh, on absolute values, you know, greater than 20 meters tall, for example. If we go to the next slide, um, this represents what we think might be a little bit more useful for national application. Um, because now the, we're using um, thresholds that reflect the potential within a given ecoregion. So of course, um, the height of the tallest, oldest forests might differ between one ecoregion and another. And so we use, in this case, percentiles of stands of forests that, that have no evidence of human pressure and have no recent disturbance. So these, these forests we think represent those that are, are, are older and, and not altered by people. Um, so we use those data to basically identify what is the upper 80th percentile of height, for example, within that ecoregion. And then use that to come up with classes of structural condition that are ecoregion specific. So if we go to the, <clears throat> the next slide, <clears throat> these are just showing maps of, of the ecoregion groupings that we've used so far in this work. So we start with the World Wildlife Fund ecoregions, and then we've combined those to come up with um, uh, a smaller set of ecoregions that, that we think are particularly meaningful relative to forest structure. And so in Columbia, you see that we've identified, you know, just, just five or six that pretty much represent Amazon Basin versus Andes Montane versus Pacific Coastal, for example. And then in the upper right, Ecuador is fairly similar. Uh, Indonesia and Vietnam, uh, a larger number of ecoregions, um, but still substantially reduced from, from the number that the World Wildlife Fund use, has been using. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> this is just an example of some of the results for those ecoregions in Colombia, of where, <clears throat> for example, if you look under the, uh, the right-hand column, for canopy height, you can see that 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 80th percentile threshold of height um, is highest in those uh, the, the the moist forest within the Amazon basin, um, and lower, for example, in the dry forest or in the uh, the northwest coastal forest. <coughs> um, so again, this is just an example of trying to, to, to try to develop thresholds for these weights for a structural index that, that are specific to ecoregions. Um, if we go to the next one, we can just look at an example of the three data layers that we use in developing the structural condition. Um, canopy cover in the upper left, in the upper middle, uh, year of forest loss, and then the upper right, tree height. And then in the bottom, how those uh, have been integrated into this um, structural condition index. You know, showing uh, high, high levels of, of structural complexity in the Pacific coastal forests and then also in the Amazon basin and then in, in patches within the Andes, for example, but not so much in that northwest um, moist forest. And the next slide would be um, a comparison of the forest structural condition in Colombia on the left with Indonesia and Vietnam on the right. Um, and just by looking at the distribution of the blues, those forests that are more structurally complex you can see there's quite a difference in these two regions in, in, the, uh, in the availability of those, those uh, 
fuller structural classes. Um, moving then to the next slide, let's now talk about how we build upon that, those structural condition uh, classes um, to get at forest integrity. So on the left, again, we have just the structural condition classes that for Columbia that we saw in the previous slides. On the right is the human footprint at just three levels, low, medium, and high. And we are, we're basically using this forest integrity index equation, um, combining structural condition with the human pressure from the, from the human footprint um, to come up with this index of, of forest integrity. Um, and again, what, what this basically gets at is, is allowing us to identify where are the places that have forests of high structural complexity but low human footprint. Um, and if we go to the, to the next slide, we'll see a, a similar graphic uh, for, South, for, for uh, Indonesia and Vietnam. And, and again, we see um, you know, lower, com lower structural complexity forests and higher human footprint, and hence uh, relatively little of, of the landscape that's in, in the, the high forest uh, integrity condition. Um, the next slide basically now compares the, the area under sort of the, these different ways of mapping forest. Um, just to illustrate that, in fact, the spatial patterns of these do overlap, but they tend to differ in interesting ways. Again, for Columbia, with simply places that are mapped as forest in the upper left in green, and then on the upper right, the blue represents places that are forest um, and low human footprint. And you can see that, particularly in the Andes, um, lots of the forests are not classified as intact because there's fairly intense land use. And then in the lower left, here's our, our structural complexity index. Um, and you can see that it, it again, the many of the forests in the in that Amazon, I'm sorry, in the Andes region um, are fairly low in forest structural complexity. Um, and then finally, in the lower right, the areas of high forest integrity. And uh, and again, you can see that, um, say, in the Amazon basin, almost everywhere where there's a forest, it's of high forest integrity. Um, in the uh, in the Andes, that's not true. And so, if we look at the table, uh, particularly for this for the montane forests in the Andes, uh, we can see that only a, a much smaller proportion of the forests are intact, low human footprint, um, and then still few fewer acres of forest are um, are high integrity forest. So there's quite a difference in these layers in the Andes, um, in the um, in the Amazon basin. That's much less true. So these are just uh, examples of how these maps differ in different places. And uh, we're I have just one or two more slides. If we go to the next one, um, we're we 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 agree with you. There's a real need to try to validate these the integration of these different data layers you know, to, to really understand to what extent are we able to, to map structural complexity accurately um, and forest integrity accurately. And so we're particularly interested in working with you to, to try to get access to field data that would allow us to um, get at things like our, our estimates of height um, and canopy cover and so forth. Um, and then we're also interested in whatever lighter data sets might be available. Uh, and we probably would also 
consistent with how the human footprint has been validated, want to do some Google Earth type visual validation. Um, but we're anxious to, to work with, with you over the coming year to try to, to do this sort of validation. And then if, if we go to the last slide, this just sort of lists some of the some of the ways that these different data layers um, might be applied relative to your reporting. So again, if we could go to, to the next slide and final slide, there we go. <clears throat> so Matt's talked about quantifying loss rate, for example, um, through forest cover and, and his data sets. And, and, and coming up next, uh, Patrick will be talking about fragmentation and connectivity. When we get down to the structural condition stuff, this is where maybe we can begin to develop these different sort of structural stages of forest as well as structural complexity. And then the forest integrity just adds to that um, human pressure. And so that allows us to identify, for example, you know, where are primary forests that, um, that have low human pressure or have increasing human pressure? Or where where are the where are forests that have had continuously high human pressure? So I'll end with that with with this just being some of the possible applications of these these data layers. Great, thank you, Andy. And I just want to let everyone know that we have 20 minutes left in our call today, and we do have one more presentation. So we'll take a couple of questions and then. Um, we'll advance on to the next presentation, recognizing again, this is just um, one of many conversations that we want to be having, and it's great that there's so much interest in dialogue today. So um, there's actually a question, a holdover human footprint question um, from Naiba, who said they downloaded the human footprint data sets, and there are two, one ending in INT, and the other with no ending. What is the difference between them? Hi, it's Oscar here. Um, integer, the INT is just an integer version of the same data, so the data file is a little bit smaller and easier to work with. And the, um, the one with no ending should be continuous, uh, continuous values with uh, decimal points in terms of the human footprint. Great. Thank you, Oscar. Okay, uh, Andy, there's a question from Susanna. Hi, Susanna. Hey, sorry. Uh, more than a question is uh, kind of um, uh, a comment regarding uh, country boundaries versus ecoregion boundaries. Uh, and is is if we agree that the that the end point of this data will be national reporting, uh, how how do we um, uh, analyze data in a way that is compatible for either getting a, a, a good picture about what's going on at the ecoregion, but also providing enough information or complete information regarding the national trend. And I'm saying this uh, uh, because two things. The, the first is that the, the data that you gave us regarding Colombia missed one of the biggest ecoregions, that is the, the Llanos. Um, is, um, very little uh, density of forest, but it's one of the regions that uh, has been developing and changing very fast in the last 10 years. So, and the upper part of the of the dry the, the dry areas in Colombia, the northern part. So, if you are an official that want to 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 file a report at the national trend, um, a cut. Uh, information with some regions in and some regions out might not be um, informative at the national level and desirable for reporting, right? But at the same time, you are putting uh, the data in relative terms to what the ecoregion behave, how the ecoregion behaves, regardless of the of the national uh, boundaries. So I wonder what is the rationale or what will be the rationale to produce country information relevant for uh, for reporting and keeping the you know the the ecological um, uh, roundness or like uh, yeah <laughs> the ecological uh, information about about it about the data yeah excellent um, 
you know, what we've done so far, we're more or less meant to just demonstrate the approach to try to get feedback from folks as to its utility and usefulness and how it ought to be modified. Um, so I, I'm very happy to, um, to redo those analyses with the eco-regional units that, that are meaningful for national reporting. Um, and if you, you know, if, if you wanted to, in the next, you know, few weeks sort of make recommendations, send me maps of the eco-region units that, that you think we ought to be working with, that would be great. And then, and then as, uh, as I uh, come and work with you, um, we can really uh, redo that analysis to, to have the units that are meaningful. And of course, that's true in other countries as well. Um, you know, as an ecologist who, who doesn't yet know many of your, your countries and, and ecosystems, I, I just had to guess at ecoregions that might be meaningful. Um, again, just to illustrate the approach and, and any of your suggestions as to, um, again, how to, how to modify and refine these approaches for your country, I would much appreciate it. Great, thank you. So um, just watching the time, I'm wondering, are there any more immediate questions for Andy? There is a, there's a big question, and I'd like to save it for after the next presentation. And that is, um, unless you think you could take it on right now, Andy, since we realize there are many different forest definitions in several countries, how do we deal with this issue? Um, feel free to go ahead and start, but I just wanna make sure we have 10 minutes for the last presentation. Yeah, just a brief response. Um, you know, I, I think the answer to that needs to evolve um, mostly, mostly in country um, with regards to which of these different layers are most meaningful to the to the biodiversity planning that that you're doing and reporting on. Um, I guess our hope is to provide you with lots of information on what these different ways of mapping forests um, can offer and how accurate they are and how they relate to different elements of biodiversity to, to inform those decisions about how to, which layers to use and how. Um, I think it's an excellent question and it, and it really gets into kind of the heart of, you know, what's really important from a conservation planning point of view and from an ecological point of view. So thanks. Yeah, it's one that's come up before and one that we should definitely have more dialogue around in the future. So I want to move into the last presentation, which is at Patrick Jantz and Scott Goats of Northern Arizona University. And they're going to be talking about forest fragmentation and connectivity analyses. And then if everyone had five extra minutes to stay on the line after their presentation, we could take closing questions. Okay, over to you, Patrick and Scott. Okay, thank you all for hanging in there. Um, so yeah, I'm Patrick Jantz, and I'm working with Scott Getz at Northern Arizona University to assess the fragmentation and connectivity of high integrity forests. Um, so I'll just give you a quick update on where we are. Um, so we know that fragmentation has detrimental effects on biodiversity and a range of ecosystem services. Um, and so maintaining or enhance, enhancing forest connectivity can help preserve some of those essential functions. Um, <clears throat> so in this slide, we see um, kind of a brief definition of fragmentation, which is the process of contiguous forest areas that are broken up into smaller forest patches. Um, and generally, fragmentation is quantified as a function of patch size, shape, and isolation. And this is an example of high integrity forest um, in the Napo Moist Forest ecoregion of Colombia, just as an example. And I've taken the top two classes um, kind of arbitrarily of the uh, forest integrity data set and classified those and, and I'm calling those the high integrity forest patches in this case, just to illustrate the approaches that we're taking. Um, but what we'd like is a metric or set of metrics that can quantify 
the gradient of fragmentation that we see in this map. Um, and so next slide. <clears throat> so what I'm showing here is the uh, output from a morphological spatial pattern analysis, and that's MSPA. And it's not as complicated as it sounds. Um, but it's nice because it can provide multiple or uh, yeah, provides information on multiple aspects of fragmentation. Um, so you see that it, it does a decent job of capturing this fragmentation gradient from the core of the eco region, say to the north where <clears throat> uh, where the forest is more fragmented. So green represents uh, less fragmented uh, classes and um, brown and yellows and oranges represent more fragmented classes. So next slide. Um, right, so we'll zoom in uh, for a closer look, uh, just, just to get an idea of how this works on the ground. Um, uh, so here's, again, is this zoom of high integrity forest. Um, you can see the, the spatial variability of patches um, and fragmentation. So next slide. Um, <clears throat> so in this slide, we see that each pixel has been put into one of several classes, um, and these classes are, are essentially based on the context of each pixel. So is it surrounded by other forest pixels or is it surrounded by um, non-high integrity forest pixels? Um, so next slide. <clears throat> so here are the, the main classes that come out of this um, process, this MSPA process. Um, so we see core high integrity forest is in dark green. Um, Perforations, these are, or sorry, I should go back and say that core forest um, is considered any forest that is more than a certain distance from an edge. And in this case, it's just one pixel distance, um, but this can be modified based on the, the situation or application. Um, and then the perforations um, are small internal gaps within core forest. Um, and edge, uh, can be considered the interface between core forest um, and the surrounding landscape. And then core connectors are high integrity forest patches that are not big enough to be core, um, but that are still connected to core forest. And then what's left over are the isolated patches. And so these are not big enough um, to be considered core and are also not connected to any core forest. Um, and so the nice thing is that because this is a pixel level classification, the information can be summarized at multiple scales. And we can, yeah, this, this is good. Um, <clears throat> so, so right, and so in addition to these base classes, um, this MSPA, MSPA analysis can form the basis for a wide array of uh, statistical fragmentation summaries, um, such as uh, that some of you may be familiar with in, in your own work. Um, so core area index, the fraction of a um, high integrity forest that's, that's considered core. You could calculate edge densities, you can calculate distances to edge, and you can calculate the number of patches. So next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so here's just an example of that core area index. Um, so on the x-axis, we see the just the absolute area of high integrity forest for a few ecoregions in Colombia. Um, and then on the y axis, we see the percent of that high integrity forest that's considered core. Um, so we see a couple of different patterns here. Uh, there are some ecoregions with larger amounts of high integrity forest, um, but with either high or low fractions of core area, suggesting uh, differences in, in fragmentation patterns. Um, and we also see ecoregions with smaller amounts of high integrity forests and either high or low fractions of core area, suggesting um, <clears throat> also different patterns of fragmentation. Um, so you can envision that um, we could do this across multiple areas, multiple countries, um, ecoregions within countries, um, and potentially over time as well to, to get an understanding of how um, changes in high integrity forests are affecting uh, uh, core area and represent fragmentation. So next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so this software that you use, you can use to generate morphological spatial pattern classes is freely available. Um, it runs on multiple systems. Um, 
and so it's it's very convenient. It can be used uh, with uh, essentially any data set that you <clears throat> that you have. If you want to do more regional or local applications, um, but one thing it does not do is quantify the potential effects of the non-forest or non-high-integrity um, forest matrix on the connectivity of those high-integrity forest patches that are of highest conservation concern. Um, so the next step in our work will be um, corridor mapping plus a network analysis. Um, and so this is just an example of that. We don't have a full <clears throat> analysis uh, completed yet, but this just gives you a flavor of, of how the approach might work. Um, so you can consider connectivity, the degree to which the landscape facilitates or impedes movement of organisms, energy, um, and material. And so what this map is showing, this is just a, a zoom in of a, <clears throat> a high integrity forest patches um, in north northern part of Colombia. Um, or central part of Colombia. And so what this map is showing is, a, is essentially just the linear transformation of high integrity forests um, to a cost surface. Um, and so uh, lighter colors uh, correlate to higher cost um, and darker colors uh, to lower cost. Um, and uh, <clears throat> essentially these these colors represent the difficulty of movement to uh, species that um, depend on high integrity forest. Um, and we'll, we'll certainly do some refining and updating to this um, to make sure that it, you know, that it <clears throat> respects all of the, all of the uh, particularities of the human footprint and the forest condition data set. So this is, this is a, an example though. Um, and essentially, I've drawn these points uh, somewhat arbitrarily, but just to illustrate how the corridor mapping works. So the next slide. And so this is just showing a cost distance corridor between these two points. Um, and so what it shows is, is brown is um, more suitable for movement and, and kind of darker blue is, is less suitable for movement. So it's kind of informative. It shows that the, the large patch on the right is itself um, a suitable place for movement um, for species that require high integrity forest. And then it shows a narrowing of the optimal route as you move through lower integrity uh, forest areas. Um, it moves through a, <clears throat> a small patch between the, the uh, larger patches um, and then eventually terminates at the lower left hand point. Um, but essentially this is showing us what is currently, according to these data sets, the optimal route for moving through high integrity forest patches. So avoiding uh, this forest of low integrity and trying to accumulate as much high integrity forest on the path as possible. So next slide. And so you can imagine that after mapping corridors between patches in a landscape, we can perform a network analysis. Um, and this can help us quantify the importance of individual patches and corridors within a broader network. And there are a variety of algorithms and approaches that have been established um, and uh, uh, frequently used. One is the equivalent connectivity index. Um, and it's nice because it takes into account the area of the patches or the quality of the patches. Um, that are being connected, as well as the probability of movement between the patches, which can be quantified um, as a function of that, uh, of the integrity of the forest um, between those patches. Um, so next slide, please. So next steps are basically to refine and test these approaches with the pilot countries and um, with the forest integrity team. And I think that I'll wrap that up um, and just say thank you for your attention. Great, thank you for the presentation. Right at 10 minutes. <laughs> so um, I can expect there's a few more questions and I'm sure some of you might have to leave, especially, especially our folks out in Asia where I know it's getting really late, but for, for anyone who could stay on, are there any questions for Patrick and Scott or follow-up questions for Andy or any of the other presenters that we had today? Okay, so um, we have a question from Susanna. Yay, Susanna, what's your question? Thanks I'm for such so active. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I love uh, it. You are. Okay. Uh, it's just, just a quick question regarding um, 
is, is this analysis um, a static? Are you planning to do some trend on, on this uh, analysis or not? Yeah, so thank you. But right now it's so it's static. So we'll, we'll <clears throat> essentially we'll use the um, the forest integrity data set to to get a baseline. Um, but we we should be able to add, for example, one thing I've thought about is being able to add um, forest change information um, on top of those um, priority corridor areas, for example, um, as a way to assess how. To, to make it a little more dynamic. Um, and eventually we'll have the data sets for both the human footprint um, and forest cover down the road um, to make it a, a dynamic analysis. So yes, yeah, so I think there's a couple ways that we can that we can start to get at, at trends and how um, uh, human activities and deforestation might be affecting fragmentation and connectivity. Uh, and if I could just follow up on that. Um... doing uh so again we're what we're presenting is somewhat aimed at just describing sort of pilot analyses to get to get your feedback um it would seem very important uh for the reporting i think to to do the fragmentation and connectivity analysis for forests in general or for intact forests um, as well as for uh, high integrity forests. Um, again, because these different ways to map forests probably mean different things to different species. And particularly for the, uh, for, 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 forest, uh, for forest itself, you know, we have that, <clears throat> as Matt described, we have that annualized. So, um, that's for that data set. There's a real opportunity to show trends over the 16-year period in fragmentation or in connectivity. So, Suzanne, I th again, I think your point's well taken. And for some of these layers, we can in fact do the analyses in a dynamic way. Um, right now, for integrity, it's it's more or less for one time period. But um, but as Patrick said. Um, at least for South America, as we get the additional height data for other years, we can we can do some dynamic analyses for that as well. Great, thank you, Andy. We have a few more questions coming in. Uh, this is from Dao Tong. Just remember, when you develop maps for Vietnam, please you use the UN recognized country map, where there are two little groups of islands to right to the right to make the maps more accepted. Otherwise, the government will not use the maps we are producing. So perhaps you could put that in an email to me, and then I'll pass it on to the rest of the team, just so that that's clear. Um, let me take you off mute to see, oh, Daltong, you have the opportunity to take yourself off mute if there's anything else you'd like to add to that comment. And then there's a question from Anna Lucia. I'm gonna unmute you now. Hi. Hi. I switched back to my phone. Yes. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think um, my question was sort of answered in the previous comments because um, I was wondering if we could do analysis of a specific populations just to know to to address this point that connectivity will will be different for specific populations and I'm thinking at least Central America has uh, the Jaguar population sort of mapped and and it could be like a specific study maybe that we could use yeah that's more mm -hmm. oh no go ahead uh, you can no, no, go ahead I'm, I'm done I uh, know. I was just going to say that, that. Yeah, I think that's a <clears throat> that, that that that's a fantastic idea. It's it's quite difficult to validate kind of a I guess you'd call it a structural connectivity analysis. Um, but kind of understanding where we have information for particular species um, about how they use the landscape and how they respond to to forests 
pattern and then to human activities that are related to those forest patterns, I think can be very valuable. Great, would anyone else like to add on to that answer? And Lucia, does that answer your question? Yes, I think we're, <laughs> it's just opening up possibilities that of what we can do or, or or how we can use this information with what's available also to at the um, well in this case the a more regional Central America point perspective that can be um, can give us more about trends and what's happening really on the ground. Great, I agree. That's exciting to hear your feedback. Yeah, and I, I would just say that I'd be happy to to follow up in the next few weeks or a couple of months um, to think more about how we could could um, kind of start to realize that. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great idea. Cool. Thank you. All right. So we probably have time for one more question. Is there anyone else that would like to ask their question, or is there anyone from the science team that wanted to add? a response to the question about um, there being different definitions of forest around the world and how to deal with that issue in closing. Okay, I'll take your silence as a sign that this webinar should now conclude. I want to thank everyone uh, who stayed on the line. We have representation from our pilot countries around the world, which is really exciting. Um, and for our presenters, thanks to everyone for working with the different time zones we have. This is really the only time that works to get all of us on a call at once. We'll share a recording of this conversation next week. Um, I also would love to hear your feedback. Is this useful, especially for the pilot countries? Is this useful? Is this something you want more of? Uh, what topics do you want to go into? Do you want uh, more detailed technical support uh, using each of the data layers to do analyses? Uh, do you want to have philosophical discussions about data? Do we need to have a conference call on validation and how that might look? Um, really interested in hearing from all of you and letting you guide us on where we should go from here in terms of this kind of technical support. And then from the technical team, uh, as always, whatever you have to offer, I think is very useful. So uh, we'll look forward to more uh, technical guidance and also more data. And then for everyone, I hope that we can start having more conversations about how you can actually integrate these data into your six national report work plan and how you think you'll be able to use it. So with that, I'll conclude the webinar and just thank all of you again for your attendance and very informative presentations and discussion. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Chrissy. Great. Thanks, Chrissy.